Welcome, welcome. <laughs> welcome, everybody. Welcome to Class Cast number 16. Uh, we're here with tips. We're here with Stay Safe, myself, S Fand, and we're joined by Kevin Jordan, uh, who's actually one of the three original game designers hired onto the World of Warcraft team. Kevin, could you tell us how we got started with Blizzard and what exactly you did on the WAT team? Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Kevin Jordan, and I, uh, I got my start um, as one of the original three game designers. Uh, I was sort of the second full-time game designer, um, and the third, uh, the, the original game designer, was Alan Adham. Uh, but I was the he was only part time at the time, uh, taking a break from this last project, and so I was hired in as the the second full time and uh, the third actual designer on the team. So I was there close to the beginning, and certainly for all the foundational decision making and whatnot for Vanilla WoW. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you so you told us beforehand that uh, you had a big involvement with. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the class design. You you did a lot of the original spell tables. Um, what 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 class did you probably have the most? Uh, I, I guess the most input on and the, and the most impact on, or what classes I should say. Uh, well, all of them, honestly. They're mm -hmm. they're uh, yeah. We didn't have at the beginning. We didn't have enough game designers to actually split them up. Uh, so they sort of all fell in my lap, uh, and I had to treat them all as my. <laughs> as my children and make sure that none of them were the favorites and that kind of thing. Um, right. Uh, just to clarify, I didn't, t I didn't actually do like a lot of the math on the spell tables and whatnot. Like, uh, we had a technical designer who was amazing for that. And also Alan Adham started with the original tables, uh, just to define a lot of that stuff. And we'd have meetings on how things should go and what the basics were. But, um, yeah, my, my job was game design, right. Rather than, numbers design or math design and that kind of thing, which is super important to the way, you know, a game plays out. Uh, but yeah, my focus was always game design, so. And I'm just gonna... to hear you say it real quick, the staff of Jordan is named after you, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just, okay, awesome, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Is, the, there, uh, is there a reason why it was a staff and not some other random item? Well, Stone of Jordan was from uh, Diablo, uh, and that became sort of the currency of the game. Um, because gold was so meaningless, um, but that was not named after me. But it was so iconic in that game um, that people felt like, well, we need to have our own Jordan item, and we actually have a Jordan right here on the team. So let's make a uh, <laughs> let's make a staff. <laughs> so they may end up making a staff, and then I got some items in there named after my girls as well. Someone made them; that was really nice. Oh, that's oh, really nice. cool! Awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> So we, um, well, you know, we, we got a chance, like I said earlier, we got a chance to talk a little bit with Kevin uh, a little bit beforehand and uh, kind of got to pick your brain a little bit uh, ahead of time. But um, one thing that a lot of people have, a lot of people have, have, have talked about this before, and it's, and it's how uh, the philosophy of the game, uh, particularly in terms of like class design and uh, just the direction of the game, uh, is or like the game the direction that the game was heading changed a lot throughout the course of the game and uh, particularly in Cataclysm mm -hmm. it was one of those th one of those things where in vanilla in Burning Crusade even in Wrath it kind of felt like you were playing more of a class and then in Cataclysm it changed to where you're playing more of a spec. Um, right. What was your guys' general uh, general class design philosophy whenever you guys were originally making the game? Yeah. So we we started with we wanted. Uh, certain number of classes. Um, we settled on nine and we wanted to make sure all three roles were represented. We had games like EverQuest to draw from and Dark Age and uh, some other games mm -hmm. in terms of like how group combat functions and that kind of thing. Um, so we were pretty well versed in the roles, you know, that we wanted tank, healer, DPS essentially. Um, and then from there, it was uh, trying to get in as many of the heroes and units from the previous Warcraft games into the game, right? So we wanted people to be able to feel like I played the RTS and I can take control of one of these individual units and play as that as that character in a game where I'm seeing the world that I've I've seen only from a top-down perspective, um, 
for the first time in like this 3D environment. So, well, so we just went through the units and we looked at what kinds of characters are these. And we obviously had a lot of different races and we had different um, sort of uh, the tropes, you know, from fantasy games, which is we had our warriors and we had our mages and we had our um, ranged range classes. And so we set out to make all of those and we ended up with nine that sort of represented all of those things. Um, but like each class was a sort of generic template so that the details could be filled in later on, right? So warrior was essentially, it was a simple name, it was a simple concept, and it was a template so that people that wanted to be, say, a Torrent chieftain could make a Torrent warrior. They wanted to be a mountain king, they could make a dwarf warrior. They wanted to be a, um, and I hesitate to say this, <laughs> a, de <laughs> uh, a demon hunter, they could make a night elf warrior. <laughs> um, <laughs> really? Wow. And so that was basically the idea. We, we create these generic templates um, that people could sort of latch onto and then customize with their race and then some other mechanic, right, to differentiate themselves from all the other people that were also that class. We didn't have concept of the talent system yet at that time. And we actually referred to them as hero classes, uh, which we thought what we would do, which was after a point of being a warrior, you would graduate to this hero class version, which would be your mountain kings or torn chieftains or, mm. you know, demon hunters. And that would change who you were uh, and what abilities you had and, and potentially some look stuff, you know, like, oh, now suddenly you have wings because you're a demon hunter, right? right. Um, and then later on, the hero, the hero class's idea had some flaws to it and some potential hurdles. And so we ended up working up this talent system idea. And uh, that's what I ended up um, creating that talent system, which, um, again, was designed to give you a sense of differentiation from uh, all the other people that shared that class with you. So. The idea was you start simple and then allow players to inject their own creativity into what they want to be so that they stood out. And that was um, that was reinforced as well in both the look, like we wanted every class to look sort of different. Their play mechanics would identify them, right? So you look at a guy and you say, okay, well, what is he? And it's like, well, he's got a demon following him. Okay, I understand what he is immediately. He's got a pet, you know, a wolf following him. I know what he is. He just dropped a totem. I know what he is, right? Like, we wanted to make sure all the classes had sort of this identifier that, that told people what they were, and it was different from everyone else. So right. it was really important for us to have a visual, you know, sort of a, a silhouette that was different, um, a play mechanic that was different but leave enough room for people to put their own creativity and spin on things so that they felt different than everyone else. Cause for all warriors to feel the same or interchangeable felt like a, you know, big problem. In the mm -hmm. game, so. Yeah. And as, as far as the talent trees go, those in my mind are very reminiscent of the Diablo two talent trees. So did mm -hmm. you work on any other, did you work on Diablo two or Warcraft three or w when did you get your start at blizzard? Um, so I started actually in tech support. Um, hmm. You know, I'm a, <laughs> I, I consider myself sort of the poster child for how it used to work, right? Which is you, you get your job in tech support or in QA or as a GM, and then you work your way up to a development spot. And that actually was my history, right? It doesn't really work that way anymore. It's really tough to do, yeah. to go that route these days. Um, but back in the day, that's how it worked for me. And, and by the end of WoW, I'd say probably 60 to 70 percent of the team was actually made up of people that were like me had started lower in the company and worked their way up. So mm -hmm. um, I got my start in tech support, did that for a couple of years, and then a spot opened up on the design team. I applied and got thrown in. But War uh, World of Warcraft was my first game. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's how I got my start. And I didn't work on Diablo. Diablo was the Blizzard North. Um, you know, brainchild. And I played a ton of Diablo, obviously. Um, and so some of the the way that the skill trees worked in that game, uh, we found, I found interesting. But I wanted to put a different spin on it because I didn't want, there were a couple things I wanted to avoid. One was that sense of all in on something. Um, in Diablo, it was like, once you put your first point in a skill, you tended to want to put all 20 of your points yeah, in there. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so there was very little, like, deviation, right? 
it was basically just I make the one choice and then I just execute on those choices for the rest of my character's life, right? So that's why you have smaller numbers of talents per tier. But we also wanted the gold medal big big purchase, you know, moments where it was like, okay, I just got my moral strike or I just got, you know, whatever it is that's in the bottom of my tree. We put those at 11, 21, and 31 so that people could be like, oh, wow, I just made a, a big purchase. It changes my dynamic. It changes the way I play. What you just said there is so important, I think, because in Vanilla WoW, and we talked about this a little bit before we went live, there's mm -hmm. a sense of you're not playing the class, or sorry, you're not playing the spec, you're playing the class. Mm -hmm. Whereas right. today, if you're playing Retail WoW or uh, mm -hmm. BFA, you could just be an Affliction Shaman and or <laughs> an Affliction <laughs> Warlock. Sorry, an Affliction <laughs> Warlock. <laughs> best class. <laughs> and that's all you ever have to be. You never have to play any of the other specs if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Vanilla WoW, you have to dabble in and out. Like you have points in each in each talent tree. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that goes to the identity. Like, again, people being able to be creative within their class choice. Um, you put it, you put, you can put your energies to make yourself distinct, right? And so a big part of that is, well, I want, I'm a warrior, sure, but I want to be a, a dual wielding warrior, or I want to be a two hander warrior, or I want to be a sword and board warrior. And so those are your core choices on how you were going to play the game. And uh, those choices weren't always balanced, like especially, Correct. yeah, <laughs> warriors got a little bit luckier, I think, than some other classes. Um, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, Kevin, uh, what do you think, what do you think the, the ratio should be between balance and identity? When should identity give way to balance or vice versa? It seemed like in vanilla, it was more towards identity, less, less towards balance. Do you think that was the right decision at the time? Absolutely. Um... I think balance is perfect balance is really overrated right like mm -hmm. uh in games and um you'll hear like this was a quote from one of the starcraft uh two dev members where it was like uh in designing intentional imbalances right it's like one of the goals um because you want there to be like in a game like starcraft you want there to be counters and um people trying to figure things out, right? And what's that sense of mastery, right? So you leave it a little bit open. Despite how balanced StarCraft was, it was still, there were still places where you could show your mastery, right? right. By sort of exploiting, oh, I found the combo, right? Which is really important for players to feel like they've beaten the game designers, right? Like they figured out <laughs> something the game designer yeah. never intended, right? And we're so smart, right? Um, and so, and, and I knew that this would always exist. Like balance was really important to me in terms of like trying to avoid the stigma that we all saw. Like, oh, you're this spec, you'll never be invited. That was bad. Um, but I cared a lot more about people feeling like they were a thing. I am a fire mage. I am a retribution paladin, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, rather than um, everything being perfectly balanced because perfectly balanced uh can lead to homogenization Absolutely. like in your in your pursuit of it i should say um like perfect balance is sort of this ideal that people think that we aspire to but the pursuit of that has a lot of dangerous like opportunities where yeah, things get homogenized right um and you want to avoid that at all costs because people people want to feel different, right? Like people want to feel like they're, they're a special, you know, snowflake essentially, <laughs> and they can't be easily yeah. replaced by whatever else is out there. Right. Um, and they do that in various ways. One of which is, um, you know, creating an identity for themselves. And the other is, you know, how they play, like from a um, competency standpoint. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, imagine they're both equal. There was, imagine a game where there's only one class and one spec, you know, everyone would be exactly the same. The game would be perfectly balanced. And I think, right. You know, this is one of the biggest criticisms I hear of Vanilla WoW is, you know, ah, everything's not balanced perfectly one to one to one to one. But mm -hmm. I think the rock, paper, scissors nature of the balance in Vanilla WoW is actually, mm -hmm. I really like it a lot, actually. Right. There's this really whole good. game. I'm trying to remember the name, but it was a it was a pen and paper role playing game. And your character was essentially one number. It was really tongue in cheek. Right. But it was like you were a three. <laughs> Everything you tried to do, you were a three. at, Right. Like, right. You, that was your, you know, it was so funny because it was like, yeah, perfect balance. Exactly. You know, everyone at the table is a three, right? So yeah. none of us had any identity. And it was just, it was so funny that somebody took the time to make this game, but it, it proved that how little perfect balance actually matters when it comes to delivering fun and interesting, compelling content, things like that. So 
Right, for sure. So speaking of balance, one of the big things in Vanilla WoW um, that's criticized, I guess, is how hybrids play out, mm -hmm. whether it's Paladin, Shamans, Druids. Um, and I think to some extent, you know, you can even throw priests and warriors in there, right, as, as far as the comparison, right. because like I, I've always considered warriors to be a hybrid class because they're a DPS and a tank. Um, right. So in a sense, they're a hybrid. But uh, how did you guys... Your guy, your your guy's original, like let's take Paladin for example, because I play Paladin. Mm -hmm. Your guy's original design philosophy behind a Paladin was to have a Paladin up on the front lines, fighting with everybody, yes. and kind of doing off heels, like like a support DPS class. Right. But then, did you guys kind of change how you <sighs> change the, the itemization of the gear and and kind of how things how things were presented to the player base based on player data of how players were treating the classes like shamans and paladins and whatnot and having them heal in raids mostly uh well yes and no okay so the yeah the original intent was to make a class that fulfilled the you know the, the purpose of every class is to fulfill the fantasy that the player has when they come into it right mm -hmm. what is the fantasy behind the paladin well the fantasy is I am heavy armor. I have a big weapon. I've got this this book as well, which you know is my book of light. And I wade into the middle of things, and I'm very durable, and I cast support spells and things like that. So that's the fantasy, right? What ended up happening because of the math of the game um, is he became you know a flash of light spammer, and he would sit in the back, nice and safe. Uh, from cleaves and area of effects and just spam flash of light because it was the most efficient heal in the game right mm -hmm. efficiency was always a big deal in raids and things like that any fight that took a long time and so we weren't fulfilling the fantasy in that sense right and the the paladin tank the prop paladin wasn't strong enough at tanking and the red paladin wasn't strong enough at dps um, and so over time people got accustomed to that's what a paladin is they got accustomed to the fact that he's a flash of light spammer his role is to sit in the back cast heals super efficiently and carry the raid to victory right and so all of the items required to be that had to be for the holy spec right because mm -hmm. um, people wanted to be competitive right so people needed those items so you drop a ret hammer that had strength and you know damage on it and everyone would be in an uproar because it was like we just did all this work to kill this boss what i need is a you know healing healing item and what i got was something for a spec that i'll never play <laughs> right um and then of course the reddidens out there were like oh sweet <laughs> you know like <laughs> whether they were hidden reddidens or not it was just like okay i'm actually a closet reddidin but i'm playing it <laughs> yeah. holy right yeah. Yeah. and yeah, oh, thank man, god you I couldn't did. inspect talents back in the day because uh yeah <laughs> definitely did that <laughs> so you go off in solo and you're like oh i can't wait to take this hammer for a spin right <laughs> like, so it's the greatest moment ever but you have to pretend oh i guess i'll take the hammer you know <laughs> like when you're playing right so um yeah so some of that was you know obviously driven by uh, how the community was reacting to the game design and the emerging gameplay that was occurring but um again the goal was to make sure that we were delivering on the fantasy that a lot of people had coming into the game which is to be a hammer swinging front line support spell casting you know, paladin right so uh, but it was a long road the second the second he got sort of pigeonholed into the back lines throwing holy light it became a pretty long road to not just get the map right but to bring people around, you know, because once the stigma is created, it's really tough to like over overcome that with that. That stigma lasts to this day, I think. Right. Yeah. So across um, multiple classes too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I remember we would do internal raid testing, and, and I I made some you know tweaks to the palette, and I was like, here you go, I fixed it. Redditons, and redditons were actually absolutely smoking the DPS charts <laughs> in these internal <laughs> tests, right? And I was like, okay, it's fixed. <laughs> What's the problem? You know? Fixed Kappa. Yeah. And it's just like, well, we can't really go out like this because they're ridiculous and all the rogues and warriors and everyone else are going <laughs> to complain. Right. So uh, again, you have to bring it back again. But it's funny how if we had just gone out with one patch cycle of them being broken, powerful, that would have probably fixed the stigma. Right. In a, <laughs> in a short amount of time. Yeah. Right. Because then they would have been considered, right? But it took so long by doing, trying to balance it well, um, 
for people to come around. They're like, yeah, okay, Reddit in. Maybe, maybe it's good enough. Like if you get all your gear and right. you're, you, you learn your rotations, but we kind of have our thing going. We have our rogue and warrior for that job. We don't need you. We need you in the back throwing your heels, right? right. So it's just so difficult to like overcome that. So I, I think yeah. one, I think one of the big things, uh, and I've talked about this before, but it, it, it totally falls in line with what you were just saying. Paladins weren't reworked until the 1.9 patch. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, they didn't have a, a dedicated ret set for the tier sets until uh, the Avengers set in AQ40. Right. So kind of the combination of, of everything kind of hitting in 1.9. And then yeah. you've gone through, you know, eight patches of the game, just like you were saying, where it's like, well, the healer or the Paladins were all in a healing role. Mm -hmm. It ended up being a situation where anybody who was progressed far enough in raid content in a guild like that, then they had their paladins as healers. It wasn't something where like, you know, if they got lucky, they could maybe pick up some of the gear and, and do it in PVP or right. uh, anything like that. But as long as their guild stays together, then there wasn't really a situation where somebody could transition. Uh, that's why like, you know, for me and, and you know, for, for a lot of people like having, playing vanilla WoW patch 1.12 and going through the entire game with the uh, end game talents kind of changes how the early game plays out quite a bit, specifically right. for hybrids too, for, for paladins. Yeah, and one thing we learned about hybrids, um, just a quick note, is that if you're 10% behind at your core competency, then you're not invited, right? Mm -hmm. That's all right. it takes. And yeah. so this idea that a hybrid would be jack of all trades, master of none, just absolutely fails in an MMO type setting. Um, you have to be like within 5%, within striking distance mm -hmm. of the best at that role in order to be viable, right? Well, it's yep. like one of the ways you guys that. made that up. Yeah. And so, and, and that's how fine the margins were that we discovered, right? So it did change our philosophy on, on how to balance them, right? right. Um, uh, regarding that other thing you were talking about, how long it took to sort of put in patches for the Reddit. Um, some of that is, you know, community pressure, like the squeaky wheel, right? Getting the grease. You'd be surprised, at, or maybe not, but the all of these all the um, competitive players are the usually the most vocal and they're most vocal about the things that they're currently using that they need to be better right and so the elements that they were using they were not using the reddit right they were using the holy paladin and so the number of complaints we got about holy paladin was through the roof compared to reddit who was just like this lost spec right like we still got complaints about the Reddit and like, Hey, where's my, you know, hammer swinging paladins in the front row. And it's like, well, he's not raiding. That's for one. <laughs> um, and so most of the complaints we were getting were about things that people were using. Were your tanks being better? Um, you know, holding paladins being better. Mm -hmm. uh, Frost mages being better. Right. Like, I, th those... I think that, I think that realization really, really shows in tier three gear in next Ramus, which is really itemized perfectly right. for just the most optimal spec for each right. class. You know, the, right. the tier three paladin gear is holy tier yeah. three warrior gear is protection. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and that, you know, that's because we're trying to serve, you know, like the, the way the game is being successful. Right. So for us to take, take time off from trying to satisfy what became like this just tidal wave of feedback, right? Because we were expecting, you know, if we do really well with a 500,000 subscribers, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden there were just millions and the tidal wave of feedback we were getting was just like so powerful. Um, and it, you know, since we're human beings and it's like, we, at the end of the day, we want to make people happy, right? <laughs> There's always that pressure. And so, you know, as a game designer, you try to eliminate that pressure and just try to do what's best for the game. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the pressure you feel it, it's just like, well, let's give them what they want. Let's give them that holy spec, you know, gear. And we'll get to the Reddit in a little bit later. Mm. No one's playing Reddit in at the time. <laughs> it's <laughs> sort of a thought because no one's complaining about it. And so we'll put that on the back burner sort of thing. But yeah. so you're, you're saying if you uh -huh. want something, just complain really loudly. That's always been the way everything works in life. Really? Right? Yeah, cool. <laughs> let me, yeah, let me, let me let you in on that little secret. Um, yeah, but, but, uh, but yeah, as a game designer, it's like obviously mistakes were made. Like we should have put more time into making everything better. Um, 
but it was just the easy go-to fix, right? To say, mm -hmm. okay, well, all these people that they actually do need things, right? Because I used to have these giant lists of here are all the things these classes, these each of the specs need, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, I have to pick one. I have 27 and I got to pick one to work on. And I can get through five of these before the next patch or whatever. Right. And so I had to prioritize and I had to make, you know, tough decisions. And unfortunately, even though I was playing a Reddit in, you know, pretty much my entire WoW career, I also had a max level mage, undead mage. Um, I, I wasn't able to get to my class, you know, and I played Reddit in pretty faithfully, you know, throughout um, WoW's lifetime when I was playing it. But the other thing to consider is, you know, not everyone's playing at that competitive level, right? So like for me personally, it's like I would play with people from work and we do it very casually. Hmm. And we, we well, not casually in the sense that we were still hitting sort of, you know, we, we'd go to lower Black Rock Spire and we had our DPS basically heavy group. We had a tank and four DPS and we called it the burn it down spec, right? Because <laughs> we had to kill it. <laughs> before it killed our tank because we didn't really have any healing. So, <laughs> um, but we made it work, right? And a lot of us were pretty good players, you know, and uh, it was just very chill, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of people play the game. They're just playing with their friends and doing crazy weird things. And they're not hitting the cutting edge or the bleeding edge content. And so the fact that they're a Reddit in or an off spec of something doesn't really matter. They're just having a good time, right? So mm -hmm. um, we also just felt like, yeah, as long as that's still going on and, and people are having a good time, then not everything has to be, you know, perfect, right, in terms of paid competitiveness and that kind of thing. Right. Completely agree, 100%. Like, it's crazy. Like, a lot of people say, you know, some of the classes in vanilla are completely imbalanced. But mm -hmm. to be honest, five out of the seven raids, every raid except AQ40 and Nax Ramus, and even AQ40 to a certain extent, you can bring a lot of different classes, even suboptimal right. classes, but like Molten Core, you know, Zulgaru, stuff like that. You don't necessarily need to bring the best spec of the best class yeah. 40 yeah. out of 40, 100% of the time. And yeah, I think that's that's great design. Well, yeah, and I that's, mean, an, I would that's even an outlook say, a lot of times. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, like, I, I would even say into Nax and, and everything else, it's just about like how, how well you know the fights and how well you know to optimize like your own character. Um, like it's it's never a situation where like you can't clear the content with you can clear the content in the game all the content in the game with thirty nine people or you right. know if it's, if it's a if it's a twenty man nineteen people like if you're down one person if somebody dies right at the beginning of the fight that doesn't mean you're not going to be able to kill Kel'Thuzad right. so if that fortieth person is a boomkin is you know whatever right. yeah it's it's yeah. not gonna you know it, it, there's a lot more problems if you guys wipe yeah. than just that one guy and um, that's again that's an outlook outlook problem right it's like mm -hmm what what's your approach to this game what what lens are you viewing the game through and if that lens is hyper competitive world first rate progression right then every decision that you make is revolves through that lens right or goes through that lens and so somebody trying to bring a reddit in, absolutely not right like because mm -hmm. you're at the highest end but you take that outlook away and that's typically who leads these guilds right like guilds are usually led by achievers right Mm -hmm. and guys that are pushing that envelope and so you know the rest of it kind of trickles down right but if you if you have an outlook that's more social or more experimental or you know whatever it is then you're going to have all kinds of weird stuff going on and it's going to be fun and you're still mm -hmm. going to clear the content you might just be a little bit slower right for sure but that, that sense of ex experimentation i think is super important to a game right and once people stop experimenting and just assume they lock in on what the best thing is and, and it never changes, right? That's when a game stagnates. And Well, what's know, crazy about vanilla, repetitive. 15 years later, people are still experimenting. They're still finding new mm -hmm. metas. It's right. crazy. Yeah. The game was so complex. Yeah, and that's, um, that's healthy, right? Like, it's really good for people to circle around that stuff over and over and over. And, and again, the contextual of, well, I added this one piece. What does that do to the rest of my build, right? is super compelling right if it's just like well okay i took my my strength and attack power up in both of these and the next item does the same next item it does the same right there's never any context for you switching up or coming up with your whole plan or right. there's no more evaluation right because ideally and the old you know effective hit point 
charts that we used to have, you know, back in the day, mm-hmm. um, how one thing could change the context of everything else. That's, that's the wonders of math, right? <laughs> is that yeah. you introduce one new variable and it affects everything else potentially if that stuff is intent, you know, designed intentionally is pretty amazing. Right. Mm-hmm. So our Makes goal was to create a system that allowed for a lot of that. Yeah. Real quick, before we get too far ahead, um, uh... We, you know, we, we, we got so excited, we just got kind of got rolling. But uh, I did forget to announce the winners of our last Classic Cast virtual Ooh. ticket winners. Yeah, the the, 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 the Classic demo and all this stuff. Uh, but the winners are Kuro Soler, Lance Hutch 1, and Apriti. So you guys should uh, – I have your guys' emails here. I'll be sending you guys emails. We'll get in touch about uh, getting you guys your, your BlizzCon virtual tickets. And also – uh, we have started our new and final giveaway. This is the this is the third giveaway for three tickets that we're going to be doing. Uh, you can type exclamation point giveaway in the chat to get the link. And it's not rigged. Unbelievable. Okay. But yeah. No. <laughs> but yeah, exclamation point giveaway in the chat. Uh, Asmin hosted us earlier. Asmin, thank you so much for that. If you guys are still watching over on Asmin's channel, you guys can kind of come on over to mine. Uh, an exclamation point giveaway somebody's gonna type it you can just click the click the links there and uh do that class cast giveaway for sure so yeah sorry tips you can go ahead oh yeah i i just wanted to ask you know regarding like like you said one one piece can basically change how you play an entire class uh, there's a lot of that in vanilla uh, we talked about this a little bit before on the call about wolf's head helm the druid helmet that could just completely change how they play when you guys were designing items did you ever say okay this specific item do you want to design it for this class or did you ever expect a certain outcome by equipping that item beyond just, you know, this will make a class stronger or something like that? Yeah. I mean, it was never, obviously the set pieces were designed for a specific class, a specific, a specific role in mind. Um, but, uh, a lot of the items, uh, were designed to be extremely flexible, right? So that people could do crazy experimental things. And, uh, our original, um, item designer, I think he did a great job and he took a ton of flack <laughs> from uh, people complaining about items and whatnot. Um, and that's true for anyone doing game design. Uh, every time an item doesn't satisfy a particular outlook or a particular person's idea of what that item should give them, uh, they complain, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. some of those complaints um, were actually uh, should have been directed at me because if you guys remember, uh, there were some pieces for the mage that were agility spirit, right? Mm-hmm. And that's because I told him uh, that all classes would want all attributes in certain scenarios and so make things that have weird combinations, right? And he probably came into my office 10 times. Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> um, and, but that was always the goal. The goal was always to just create this really experimental canvas that people could play with, right? Experiment and do crazy things. And mm-hmm. um, in the reality, most people just looked at that and said, this is complete garbage. What were they thinking, right? Um, and eventually we tried to narrow it down. Okay, well, casters no longer want agility will soften our, our mm. philosophy a little bit, you know. Um, but there were still places where, you know, spirit would, would actually do the job, you know, like there were points with certain, you know, critical mass with spirit where it actually did what it was trying to do, which is making it super sustainable, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he, unfortunately, he took a lot of flack <laughs> internally and externally <laughs> because yeah. I swore to him, no, this is going to be a thing. We have to allow for this to breathe. You know? yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah the poor guy. Uh, I'll, t- yeah. I'll tell you the one, one of the most frustrating things in the world for me as a melee is whenever you're swinging at a mage and they manage to dodge something. So right, it's, right. it's not all for naught. So. That's right. <laughs> that you you definitely do see that in early vanilla WoW, you know, with, with leveling gear and early dungeon gear and raid gear, maybe mm-hmm. T1 and maybe a bit into T2, especially leveling gear where you have, you know, plate gloves with spirit strength and agility and you're like why is there spirit right. on this right and so th- that's why it was experimental then you guys kind of honed in on on what's really optimal as as the game went on right there's a there's also a philosophy um i remember uh, richard garfield came by blizzard and gave this little talk and he talked about uh, two things that i remember specifically one is 
uh, the psychology of randomness and what's okay random and what's not okay random in games. But the other was um, if you have no bad cards, then people won't know what a good card is, right? And so that's actually a design philosophy that a lot of people use, which is to say the, the bad gear is there to help define the texture of the overall experience, right? You have to have a scale, and this is true with experiences, and it's true with gear, and it's true with decision making. You know, like that's one of those things. Like you would be surprised how many people, you know, come up to you and say, "Wow, so I put this debuff on him that makes my fire spells hit harder, and then I hit him with a fire spell, dude! It was amazing," and they feel like they've discovered the most magic combo in the world, and you're like, "Cool." okay, <laughs> good, you did it, you know, like, but they feel super happy, right? Like, um, obviously, most of us are advanced beyond that point. We're like, you know, of course, right? Like, that's just what you do. But um, everyone wants to feel smart when they're making decisions. And so allowing people to, you know, that opportunity by sometimes having bad gear is actually important. You know, to, to go off that, and this is pretty nitty gritty, this is talking about spell penetration mm -hmm. and resistance values on bosses talking about right. spells hitting harder right yeah so spell penetration was added in patch 1.9 i believe with 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 on Krause. prior to that there was no spell pen in the, in the game mm -hmm. um a lot of people say that this stat was useless for pve because raid bosses didn't have enough resistance to make it right. worth it so what were the resistance ranges on bosses is it worth it to have spell penetration in pve scenarios or is it just more of a pvp stat what was the philosophy behind that yeah so the goal of it was and um you know your mileage may, may vary because i don't remember how it actually turned out in different areas but the goal of spell pen was it was more valuable on a per stat point uh level than um spell power was if you were fighting something with resist so that was the goal with it it was just better until you dropped the creature's resistance to zero. So um, that was the philosophy behind it. So it absolutely is better if you're fighting something that has resist mm -hmm. to use than just regular spell power. So, And speaking of resistances then, uh, we talked about this again a little bit before the call, but there's a big, I guess, uh, I don't want to say misconception, but there's a big enigma surrounding resistances, especially on bosses in Vanilla WoW. Do you remember by any chance, like, did you guys use an actual figure? Like, do you remember, like, a static figure that you used for resistances or anything like that? Do you remember how much, you know, uh, Frost resistance, uh, you know, Cthune had or something like that? Like, the base resistances for all the different schools? Or no, was it something? It was not something offhand. Right? Not offhand, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, no. I know that we wanted it to be, like, lower, right? Like, I don't remember the specific values, but we wanted it to be such that it would encourage you to use, you know, fireball versus frostbolt, but not make it so that the frost mage couldn't actually be invited, right? So mm -hmm. uh, that was the goal. It was never our intention to force anyone to switch specs basically in order to do content. So uh, you know, like even molten core this is what we talked about before, but even molten core, which was just like pure fire and lava and everything else, like we didn't want it to feel like, nope, you're a frost mage, you can't come here. Or sorry, you're a fire mage. You can't come here. You have to be a frost or arcane mage. So, right. So, and like you that, said, we, you said this uh, prior to us going live because there were situations in Diablo 2 where if you were a certain spec, you'd encounter a mob that was just completely immune, and so you, you didn't right. want to replicate that same issue. And wow. Yeah, and, and in Diablo, like I didn't say this before, it was like you could just skip that guy and go to the next, or reload the instance, or whatever it was, you know, reload the game. But in WoW, obviously in progression, that's not an option. So. Um, yeah, we didn't want to punish people too much. Um, and we also considered the entire experience to be what we were after, right? So it actually creates, again, that texture of like, oh, well, this boss is, I'm not going to top the DPS meters as a fire mage because he's got a little bit of fire resist. The next one, though, I'm going to go to town again, you know? So, uh, but all in all, you know, I'm going to be real good here. I'm going to be less good here. It gives everyone sort of their moment to shine, right? Like, mm -hmm. and you see that through the bosses nowadays where it's just like, yeah, melee are really strong here. Or, you know, Hunter's safety PS was a big thing back in the day, you know, because it was like, yeah, he can go to town. 
and just feign death whenever, and he's way in the back, so he's not ever getting damaged. So everyone's like, oh man, hunters are the, are the best because our healers never have to worry about them, and they're doing decent DPS, right? So mm-hmm. that was an important aspect. So we wanted different classes and different specs to have their moments to shine, but when you're progressing, and again, you're it's that cutting edge, you know, progression. All that really happens is you force everyone to the right spec. You get all the people you absolutely need for this mm-hmm. one thing. You knock it down, and then you go to the next one and create a plan for the next one. So, mm-hmm. um, but that wasn't the whole game to us. That you know, and serving that community wasn't the, the whole point of our jobs, right? So, right. You know, we had a bigger picture and a bigger world and a bigger community of players to worry about. Right. I kind of want to reel it back a little bit, and this is a question that I've always had. But uh, I believe it's the, I think it's called like the gold flecked gloves in Dead Mines. They're cloth gloves that give you strength and intellect. I think it's like four and four strength and intellect. Do you know if those kind of items were put into the game? Like it's it's in the early levels. It's in Dead Mines. If something like that drops off a boss, it's cloth, so anybody in the game can wear it, and mm-hmm. it gives strength and it gives intellect. Was it made that way so that? if you had a small five man group, somebody in the group was going to be able to use it. Or was that just like one of those goofy things? Uh, yeah. Some of the, like um, the greens were randomized, right? So right. Um, they just had different, you know, much like Diablo, they had different suffixes and prefixes. Right. Right. Uh, the blues were more and the purples were more handcrafted. Stuff, right. Right. Uh, but again, the intention was always just you know, create this experimental canvas for people to get things. Okay. And when you look at them from a big picture, you know, it's like, oh, that item doesn't make any sense, right? But for us, the sense it made, well, well, someone will take this and experiment with it, play with it, and see what they can do with a certain spec on a certain class with certain talent choices and other gear, you know, and find some way to have fun with it. Right. Yeah, so you wanted to give players agency and decision-making capability. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. That sounds, that's awesome. That right. sounds crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> that's horrible. Yeah. No. You, dude. Does it sound no, that's boring? great. Yeah. No, yeah, that's, that that's really, really idea, cool. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really, really and cool. And it just kept things fresh, right? Like, it also led to people stacking their banks with all kinds of stuff that they would get around to playing with someday. You know? <laughs> right? Right. Put all this pressure on inventory space. Okay. That's what sells, you know, mm-hmm. sells those bags a lot too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sells those 20 slot bags. Right, <laughs> for sure. Gotta push those. So, you know, speaking of uh, kind of, we're talking about spell penetration and, and people aren't really sure. Tip said it was like an enigma. Uh, like, you know, what what are the resistance values of these bosses? And, and pretty much, I would say about half the game. Uh, and, and people have made these, you know, private servers, the fan servers, uh, and, and kind of, have watched videos and this and that to kind of piece together what they think the game is. But one of the things that when we've talked about, and a lot of people are talking about this too, is that whenever the official like wow classic releases their blizzard is going to have a lot of the original data and, and how the game was made. So uh, yeah. we, we would hope, right? <laughs> that's how, that's <laughs> how it works. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so we're, we're really excited to see like, okay, we can go back and test now everything that we've learned in the last, you know, however many years and right. go back and like, Oh wait, this is actually how this works. This is actually how this works. Right. Because, uh, and, and one thing we specifically talked about was about paladins and seal of command. And I, I was really excited to hear this, you know, a little, little ret buff and classic on <laughs> private servers, seal of command can get partially resisted. And you said it was specifically designed to not get partially resisted. Yeah. All yeah. holy damage essentially. It's yeah. supposed to not get partially resistant. It can still miss, but, yeah, if it lands, it's not reduced, essentially. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's just funny because, cause, like, on a lot of private servers and stuff like that, like, uh, that's just how it works. So okay. uh, it's just that's just, like, one example of something that is not scripted correctly, you know? Yeah, it's possible. Um, I certainly am confident in that answer, but it's also entirely possible. I've forgotten something mm-hmm. about the way we wanted to balance certain things or whatever it is. So um, I wouldn't be shocked if somebody dug up something that proved me wrong <laughs> right. some old patch note that i wrote or whatever you know but, right um that's certainly the way i intended it uh certainly the philosophy behind bully damage mm-hmm. um and so that it'd be basically there's no resistance in the game because it always felt weird like who would have holy resistance um certainly all the bad guys would want it and 
none of the players would really want it because none of the mob bad guys are going to be throwing holy damage at you. Right. So, uh, well, so yeah, we I mean, imagine if Red Paladins were even worse. Resisted. That'd be terrible. Yeah, that'd be really <laughs> right. terrible. That's I right. <laughs> yeah, I'm going in PvP, guys. I'm going to stack up on my holy resist here and <laughs> just make sure the Red <laughs> yeah. has the worst possible experience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Did you guys? Go ahead, go ahead, Dips. Go ahead. Uh, did you guys balance the game at all, like classes at all, like around the leveling process? Did you ever think to yourselves like, oh, at level 20, you know, how's this class doing versus this class? Or was it all kind of focused towards the end game? Or did you just kind of make classes as unique as possible and just went along with it? Uh, so for my part, it was to make them as unique and fun and have good play patterns, right? Mm -hmm. Our technical designer was responsible for making everything, you know, sort of balanced. Um, and he did an amazing job in terms of like, Yes, there are uh, classes that can go one to 60 faster, uh, but it's not by such a huge margin that everyone's just like, wow, why would I ever play this class, right? So even though it, it never became like our overriding focus, um, it was sort of in the ballpark, right? Which I was, I was pleased with, but far more important to me was just that people had fun, right? I was, I was much more focused on the journey than the destination, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for sure 100 percent. and i i take it as a win that if you ask a player about the various classes in wow they'll say here are my favorites and here are the ones i absolutely not i can't stand right they absolutely hate them but that mix is totally different depending on who you talk to right so it's sort of some of the classes hit certain personalities and certain play styles and others hit others right and so it wasn't everyone gravitating towards these four and the rest of the five are considered tier two or tier three and just sort of forgotten about. You play those for fun, but you don't actually play them. Uh, you play them as a joke, I should say. You don't play them for fun or competitiveness or anything like that. So uh, that was my goal. And I feel like, yeah, we hit the mark in terms of people getting excited about different classes and having were a there, good time. So. Were there any classes that early on in vanilla white development you wanted to add but thematically or balance wise just didn't make the cut into the game uh not that i wanted to add i felt like we had plenty uh, mm -hmm. but uh there was a rune master class that we talked about we uh we had our eight classes and we wanted one that was sort of the freak class i refer to it as the freak class in a couple other places but um this was the class that was sort of new it was some offering something different from the classic MMO tropes. Um, and just, it was basically a brand new, unique offering from Blizzard Entertainment's take on the MMO experience, right? Mm. And so it came down to the Warlock or the Rune Master. And the Rune Master was going to cover himself with runes, be a hand-to-hand a, a -hand fighter, like fist weapons and that kind of thing. He would draw runes in the sky or on the ground or whatever and have all kinds of cool magical effects and and basically be sort of monkish in the terms of he was fighting you know hand to hand uh, wow. but the warlock uh, that one was like out of nowhere right whereas like it had no play like it had no reference material in world of warcraft or in the warcraft universe there was no rts unit like it whereas the war the warlock was like oh yeah we've got these guys you know mm -hmm. so it was much more more iconic and people could go okay oh that sounds really cool i remember those guys from you know the stories or whatever it is and mm -hmm. so that's so why the, we ultimately went with the warlock but that's crazy that the warlock wasn't the warlock was kind of like an afterthought or yeah. bonus class that's a yeah. crazy thought Dude, you almost well, didn't exist stay safe i know well, <laughs> wow i'd be playing everquest right now <laughs> yeah so I, I don't want to give the impression it was never going to exist we always knew that we wanted this free class but um but yeah, we certainly, it certainly wasn't like one of the standards or essential bits that we considered like, like the hunter, I know some people felt like, or had heard that the hunter almost didn't make it in as well. Uh, but for us, that was so necessary because some people are just really attuned to the pet class, you know, having an mm -hmm. animal companion and obviously rangers in, in various, um, you know, novels and, and, you know, like Aragorn or Strider, you know, it's the ultimate ranger. And so people are going to want to be that, right? Like good with a weapon, a ranged weapon, also kind of good with melee and can move around the forest and stuff like that. So we, we felt like that was 
it was essential hmm. and we wouldn't have like i don't feel like we would have ever released the game without that sort of essential piece because where would those people go you know in terms of oh man there's no pet class right like right. i don't want to play the freak or the warlock you know so just a random question you mentioned aragorn mm -hmm. so when vanilla wow is being developed this is peak lord of the rings movie hysteria oh did, yeah totally. did that influence your design at all uh it's funny because i we all went to see it as a company right company took us to watch it and i remember saying to a guy after you know the intermission because there was an intermission one of the movies was so long right um and i came out and I, I just basically said i don't know about you but i've been working this whole time right like because that's how so many of us felt like so many of us are like wow this is bringing so much that's relevant to what we're working on that some of this stuff is going to you know be influencing us to the point where it makes it in the game right so um absolutely absolutely it impacted us and we were all crazy for it and yeah it was it was the first like because nowadays we get a mix of quality right there's some really good stuff in our sort of culture group and there's still some really bad stuff but before lord of the rings almost all of it was really bad right so yeah. it was the first like super high quality thing that was essentially Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, you know, like that fantasy representation. And it was very high quality. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, blown away. We have a lot of people asking questions in the chat. Guys, we are mm -hmm. going to do Q&A a little bit later. So if you guys want to go ahead and start tweeting questions at us and uh, hashtag ClassicCast, that's, that's what I'll be searching for. Uh, so feel free to go ahead and start tweeting out some questions. We'll get to that uh towards the end but we, we don't want to go to q a just yet and then, then we'll move over to twitch chat as well <clears throat> uh so you know speaking of you know you, you talked about the rune master free class yeah on the vanilla wow box art there is there's been a lot of speculation about this on the vanilla wow box art there is a night elf with a mm -hmm. like you know bandana bandana he's he's, he's blindfolded right right and he's got two war glaives was right. and you mentioned demon hunters earlier whereas demon hunter like one of the original class like one of you guys were originally developing the game were you guys thinking about demon hunter at all or was that just thrown in there no i mean we we thought of demon hunter in terms of uh a guy would be able to make a night elf warrior go mm -hmm. uh dual wield and then we would give him you know glaive weapons to put in his hand and then eventually we still had this idea of hero classes that he could go on a series of quests to transform his look and, and some maybe potentially some of his abilities. Dude, that so sounds that could... so cool. How did that not make it into the game? <laughs> um, well, so here's the biggest the biggest reason I'll probably say is just um, like we already had, or I should say I already had 27 specs to deal with, mm -hmm. right? So adding a hero system or hero class system on top of that, yeah. um, Whereas each class could then make interesting choices based on potentially his race. So it was a race class specific thing to so, put in the game. Sounds like a balancing nightmare. <laughs> well, not just from a balance. I'm okay with that, right? Yeah. But from a uh, bang for the buck, like a big thing for us back in the day was, okay, well, who is this content for? Is it for everyone? Great, throw it in. Is it for one specific race class combination? <laughs> then no, we can't put that in because people are starved for content, right? So um, in order to have pulled that off, right? That, and that was one of the flaws with the system. In order to have pulled that off, we would have had to like trickle them out a few at a time, right? And it would have been a giant nightmare of like, well, who gets the love this time? Or where's mine, you know? And so it would have been like this mini PR nightmare as well as, you know, trying to, manage the balancing of it and all that stuff so uh it had its issues but probably just the biggest one was just the bang for the buck you know mm. like people we had classes we had talents we had you know the specs and we had a horde and alliance and we had the races and um so we had a lot of combinations available um so to go and do that but that was sort of what we envisioned the demon hunter would be would be and a, a hero class extension on top of the night elf warrior dual wielder choice right so mm -hmm. night elf uh, warrior fury talents and then he goes and graduates into demon hunter to get some cool wings and that kind of thing right i think Eventually, it's really cool i think it's really cool that that terminology hero class was used so early on because you you guys know when wrath came out the mm -hmm. death knight was coined a, this 
World of Warcraft's first hero class. Right. And I think that's the only time they used it. I don't think that monks are technically a hero class. Right, I, don't, right. I don't know that demon hunters with Legion are a hero class either. It's only death yeah. knights, I think. And uh, yeah, so that was sort of the execution on that old idea was, and it took a totally different form, which is we'll make a new class. We'll, mm -hmm. It'll start at a high level. We'll consider it a hero class. And it'll be super specific in terms of lore and background and you know abilities and it will be its own thing right so right. that's the form hero classes eventually took rather than the old idea uh, it was um just add more classes essentially which is something i never i always worried about right because the pie was already pretty uh pretty split you know mm -hmm. like we had nine classes we had all the roles covered and so uh, people were already having trouble sort of getting invited and so every time we added a class was that going to make that pie more problematic essentially mm -hmm. um, and so i was always really hesitant to add any more classes and what i wanted to do was keep making the, the existing classes and specs more compelling more interesting and develop from there but um yeah they eventually went a different route um i didn't work on the death knight i didn't develop it um but uh uh yeah so essentially that was the history behind the form that that hero class idea that had been around since the original talks about classes um it eventually took the form of well, let's just add more classes and and part of the reason for that is because when you ask players what they want in the next expansion a new class is probably right at the top of the list every time uh that's what players are always clamoring for right. uh, despite you know again like what it might do to the game what it might do to the the structure of how people are interacting with each other socially and grouping and raiding and putting people in their guild, you know, all that stuff. Um, people just want a new class. That's just one of those things that games have traditionally always delivered and became one of those things that people always ask for. So mm -hmm. always tons of pressure for us to add new classes. Right. I'm, I'm kind of connecting the dots here. You said the Warlocks were kind of an afterthought. When they added Death Knights and then subsequently when they added Demon Hunters, they pruned a lot of stuff from warlocks and gave it to those classes it's like warlocks are just <laughs> always on the freaking chopping block man it's ridiculous <laughs> yeah i mean that's the other problem with uh adding a new class it's like when you have the nine classes and three specs like you've covered tons of class mechanics right and the mechanics can most of the time be boiled down to into their component parts right and so it's like okay it looks a little different but it's still a dot right and it's like yeah once right. you start adding once you have 10 classes with dots it's like is any is is anyone really a dot class anymore do you feel it's special about being a dot class or unique as a dot class right so if you're just stepping on the toes of someone else every time you add like unless you come up with totally brand new stuff which is doable it's just harder to do you know it's like Who's going to invent the next actual quest you know mm -hmm. goal right it's either go fetch me something go kill something or escort something right like um it's not like new quest formula popping up all the time so it's it's the same with classes there is limited design space in terms of its components mm -hmm. um, and we want everyone to feel special right so so we've had you know before we had you on we had john stats on we had mark kern on and mm -hmm. all three of you guys have mentioned Dark Age of Camelot, you know, talking yeah. about like, you know, influences the game, uh, inspiration. D did you mm -hmm. guys draw any inspiration for like the, the hero class idea? It sounds kind of like the reverse of the original class system in Dark Age of Camelot, where you would get oh, to level right. five and then you would choose. Yes. It was it kind of like that, except flipped. It's kind of towards the end instead. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, it wasn't the first time this idea had been used, uh, the hero class or advanced classes. Uh, we had the concept of it before Dark Age came out, because mm -hmm. um, Dark Age came out sort of mid-development of WoW. And but I do remember uh, Dark Age was really important at inspiring or proving two very important concepts to us. Uh, one was um, that PvP can be a good thing, right? Like I was a huge PvP person from Ultima Online, having played that, mm -hmm. and um and almost the rest of the team all considered a pvp to be a bad thing right it was synonymous with grief behavior anytime it happened it was you know P 
people trying to just hurt other people's play experience. And so that was everyone's impression of PvP. And I was like, no, if it's done right, it can be one of the greatest things in games ever, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wrote this huge thing, this manifesto, and I sent it to Alan Adham. And, um, and I, I was crazy and impassioned in it. And here I was telling like one of the founders of the company what we had to have in the game and trying to turn him around. And, uh, he read it and came to me and said, yeah, I pretty much agree with almost everything you said. And we, we figured out, okay, well, we have to get you know, PVP in the game, right? Because it wasn't going to be a thing. There was not going to be a horde or alliance. There was just going to be like EverQuest, a bunch of races that are all just grouping together to do content, right? Mm -hmm. There was no horde or alliance at this point, really. Yeah, so, uh, and because we drew our, basically everyone that was playing EverQuest and um, EverQuest was, uh, that, it was, that's how it was built, right? It was just, everyone just makes a race and yeah, you can't go to their town because they guards will attack you, but you can group with anyone and you can play with anyone. So there's just one, you know, basically Justice League force and we'd all go out and punish the bad guys together, <laughs> right? Um, so I wrote this huge thing basically saying, well, no, this is the world of war craft and the whole thing is based on orcs versus humans, humans, right? Yeah. Awesome. And so we can't not have PvP in our game. We can't not have two different sides, right? And so I, I wrote this whole thing and I basically convinced Adam that we had to do this. And and what Dark Age allowed us to do was Dark Age came out sort of after I had convinced him, but he hadn't really experienced, right? And so we went and played Dark Age and they said, All right, we're gonna be on a on this server and we're going to go look for, look for pvp and we're going to have a good time i'm going to show you why it's important and sure enough he became like my biggest disciple right like he'd go out soloing pvp all the time i'd log in and he'd just be like all right let's go let's go let's go like he was just <laughs> hungry for it, right and so um it proved to him that you know basically wow needed pvp and that needed the sense of identity right and and Horde versus Alliance is probably the biggest decision that people make and also stand by in terms of like their identity in yeah. the game, right? So absolutely. Um, I mean, it affects friendships, right? Like you learn so much about a person, just the answer to that question, it seems <laughs> like, right? Like, can I be friends with you? Can I date you? I'm not sure, you know, right? Like, I was gonna say, marriages, question. relationships, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it ended up tur turning out to be probably the most important aspect of identity in the game, right? But uh, not only that, it just fit perfectly with the world that had already been established by all the RTSs. It was a game about war and conflict between the two sides, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, the other thing it taught us uh, was that how much more fun it is to delve down into a dungeon and defeat a boss than it is to camp a stagnant spawn like we did in EQ and just farm it over and over until you get the piece of gear you want, right? Because they didn't have instancing in their game, right? So you walk in the door and you, you send messages to the zone. Hey, is the commander spawned or is the commander camped? Is there anyone in the in the witch doctor's room? Is there anyone in the, you know, sergeant at arms room or whatever? And then, you know, whatever camp was open, you'd take your group down there and you'd sit there for six hours and farm it every time it respawned until you had all your gear. Um, and I was like, this cannot be the way our dungeons work, right? Like, right. we have to instance them so that you can have a beginning and an end. You can have a drive to push through to the end. You can tell a story, you know, that has a beginning and an end. And people can have a satisfaction, you know, of feeling like they made a run and they defeat. They got this far, they defeated the entire thing and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. so it sort of was proof and concept of and uh, why, you know, uh, dungeons were important to be treated as like uh, roller coaster rides, right? You go through them rather than sitting in one spot and just farming the content over and over. So that's why Dark Age was amazing in terms of its um, influence on us and in, in its timing of when it came out. It also did a lot of other things like, hey, we need a button, that, you know, for release when you actually die. <laughs> <laughs> slash release. Type slash release so. Yeah, I, I was a big Dayok player. So, yeah, I remember yeah. I remember the struggles as well. And that took them like nine months or whatever to put in because, you know, they put that game out in 18 months with a tiny team. So massive kudos because that was a huge accomplishment. But it was missing yeah, a lot of the basics that Blizzard would never consider, you know, release worthy. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Uh, so. 
considering PVP was sort of an afterthought, you know, mm -hmm. down the road when you're balancing classes and balancing specs, are you only thinking how does a spec play in a raid or a dungeon, or are you also thinking, you know, how does this spec interact with other specs? What's the PVP balance here? Right. Yes, we had to do all three. Right. So, uh, and some of that is just structure. Right. Like if you treat the monsters about the same that you treat the players, then the balance job becomes pretty similar, right? And so that was always the goal, right? Um, you know, you could you could change um, values on a you know, percentage basis, like a single player, um, sorry, a, a single mob that you're fighting out in the under, outdoor world that's not elite, that's your level, might have X values that don't compare to a player's but they're at least in the same ballpark, right? It's not two totally different systems. Uh, so that was what helped us make sure that the the balance was in the same ballpark, right? So killing a monster was no different in uh, terms of um, like how it played than it can killing a player. The values were just different. And of course the player was more active and using his abilities theoretically more intelligently. Some, but... some players, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the idea, but yeah. Um, so, but yeah, it didn't, it made our job a lot easier, right. In right. terms of balancing it. So, uh, but there were things that just didn't work like as far as play pattern, right? Like, um, I'll give you an example the hunter. It felt really good for the hunter to shoot, a uh, a, a same level mob coming in, you know, you shoot him three, four times, then he gets to you and you whip out your two handed axe and Raptor strike it and it dies, right. You bend down, loot it and you go to the next mob. That felt perfect, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, when a player is fighting a hunter, the, the hunter has all these mechanics to keep distance, right? And so um, it, it's a giant pain in the butt to finally get to the hunter, right? And your reward for finally getting to the hunter is a giant two-handed axe raptor strike to the head, right? <laughs> so uh, that didn't feel particularly great in terms of like the PvP play pattern. Uh, compared to the PVE one, which felt amazing, right? So uh, that's yeah. a, you know the place where things you know sometimes didn't work out as as we had hoped. Mm. So you mentioned Alan Adham, and uh, yeah, you know, you, you've heard the news. Alan Adham, he he just got promoted. There's been a lot of talk about you know Morheim leaving and and uh, Jalen Brack being promoted, but yeah. one of the things that's I think it's totally understated, and it, it might just be because. Uh, and and John and Mark said the same thing. He's he's he doesn't like the limelight. He's very kind of like under the radar, mm -hmm. but he played a huge role in uh, making WoW what it was. Yeah, uh, and, and Blizzard Entertainment in general. Yeah. So Alan left the company. And he came back two years ago, uh, and now he he got promoted onto the executive leadership team. How right. big of a deal do you think it is that uh that that Alan's in that position now? Uh, it can be a huge deal, uh, mm -hmm. especially in terms of classic. Um, but it, it, it's entirely up to him, mm -hmm. uh, honestly, like how much of a part he wants to play in classic or in modern WoW moving forward, right? Uh, so he can be an influence that um, affects classic in a positive way. And it, he could, but here's the thing that we both agreed on sort of, um, you know, that lunch we had a while back, mm -hmm. I had lunch with them last year, you know, before I came to, I moved to, out of California. Um, but we talked about the current state of wow. Right. And there's a lot of decisions that have been made over time that I don't think have been great for the game, but are essentially irreversible now, because once you give a community or a game, some things, they're almost impossible right. to pull out and, you know, take back out of the game without making a lot of people upset. Right. So. Um, so he might also, and he agrees, like, so he might also just feel like as far as modern WoW goes, maybe his hands are a little bit tied. He wouldn't have done things the way they were done, but now that it is what it is. So classic is a real opportunity. Mm -hmm. He wants to like step in and oversee it to make it again, what it was intended to be back in the day. Right. So we'll see. It depends on what his involvement wants to be. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll give you a specific example. So there. Essentially, it's it's uh, old content and new technology, right? And they're trying to merge the two, right? And so they have this job on their hands of trying to do that. And so it's a, basically a lot of technical hurdles, right? Uh, there's 
there's no design as far as like uh, making this happen. There's very little design. It's just mostly about hooking things up. So a programmer is going to come to the part where, okay, we have to get instances working. And they're going to get instances working and some other things. And they're going to go into a meeting where they talk about, okay, what progress have you made in the last two weeks? It's like, well, I got instances working. Oh, and by the way, I found the place where I can very easily add Dungeon Finder, Cross-Realm Dungeon Finder. You want me to flip that switch and turn it on? <laughs> right? And it might seem like, oh, that's a simple decision, right, to a tech guy. And and who who's going to answer that question? Right, right. right. It's going to be a tech meeting. And there isn't going to be a game designer involved, right? So who's going to answer that question? Are they going to say, well, let's go find out and have him and ask him what he wants to do, right? And he's going to say, oh, no, <laughs> right? Do not turn that on. Or are they going to say, yeah, tech is good. They're not even going to get out of that room. They're just going to say, yeah, tech is good. Turn it on. I love Dungeon Finder. It's amazing. I can find a group in no time, right? <laughs> and so... Um, and then there's going to be another question about, well, should I leave in the bug that allows Paladins to one-shot Lord Kazakh by saving up charges, right? Like, <laughs> and they go, well, no, I mean, we should fix that bug. Tech is good. Let's let's fix the bugs, right? So obviously two completely different questions mm -hmm. that in, in a lot of cases require a game designer to answer, right? Right. The question is, what is their process? You know, like, because at the moment, it seems like it's just you know old content new tech let's hook things together but is there a, a game designer and who is that game designer right like they might go instead of asking out at him they might go and ask a modern wow designer mm -hmm. and they might say yeah dungeon finder's the, the best turn it on yeah, we want it was... to have all the bells and whistles that a modern wow experience has right so again old content new technology right but it's like <laughs> All the classic people are going to be like, do not turn that on, or not all the classic people, but many classic people. Right, so right. that's a big question on how is this game going to unfold, right? What is that classic going to be? Right. And again, once you add Dungeon Finder, you can't pull it back out, right? It's right. just too difficult. People are right. too used to the convenience, right? So I, I, I think it was Mark Curran that, su that suggested this at one point, sort of a an internal constitution, like a set of mm -hmm. ideals or philosophies that they stick to that are, you know, in line with classic original design philosophy. So hopefully right. internally they've had that discussion. Okay, this is right. classic. This is not classic, you know? Right. Well, but do, but again, who's involved in that discussion? Do they even understand the difference, right? Like... I mean, I can have discussions now with people that are on the Modern Wild team and talk about some of the old philosophies, but since I've left and since Adham's left, mm -hmm. who's going to be part of that? Like, who's going to carry that flag for old school philosophy? Mm -hmm. You know, or is he just going to, Alan just going to be busy with his own things and let other people answer the classic Wild question or not? So, right. yeah, it's a, it's a big question. Like, he could have a very dramatic impact or he could you know, sort of be in the background and they could be asking other people. Yeah. I, I think one thing that uh, I'm, I'm really excited about is that in the dev water cooler update that they put out a few mm -hmm. months ago, they specifically talked about how uh, things that were not in the game in the past or, or, or I guess in the, in the past put into the game after classic, I, I worded that really weird, but things that were put mm -hmm. into the game after classic, they're not planning on having that uh, in the game. So okay. basically they want to strip down the modern game and, and kind of like reverse engineer it, engineer it back to vanilla. So right. uh, as far as we've heard so far, like we, we haven't heard anything that, you know, for those of us who might not necessarily be fans of looking for raid or looking for dungeon, um, mm -hmm. there, there's nothing that's really been alarming uh, as uh, I guess up to this point. So that's something that okay, we're, we're really excited about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, don't get me wrong. Blizzard are pretty smart if they know, this is what you guys want, and they're paying attention to what the classic community is begging for, because mm -hmm. uh, the private servers don't have a lot of that stuff, right? So, uh, but some of those things, right? You probably do want. There probably are some quality of life changes that are no-brainers in terms of cost uh, that you guys probably do want. Um, and so, it, but it would take a game designer to sort of understand the difference between you know, no cost changes and changes that are going to heavily influence the game one way or another. So, right. and I don't know who would be making those decisions or if the answer is just always no, if it wasn't present then, it shouldn't be present now. Right. So, right. you know, there's, 
it's, it's a tough thing to imagine. I don't know their process, but that's what uh, that's what I think about when I think about what their job is as far as uh, getting it ready to go. Yeah. Speaking of small sort of changes, can you explain if, if you even remember this, the, the reason for the change between eight debuff slots and 16 debuff slots? Uh, purely a tech limit. Um, tech we, limit. Always, okay. we always wanted more. Um, and we were completely hamstrung a lot of times by that limit. So mm -hmm. um, we were trying to always like horse trade, you know, like, well, give us six buff slots so we can have 12 for the raid, you know, or whatever <laughs> it was, you know. Right. Um, yeah, I actually found a blue post uh, from back in 2006 that uh, Eonix. Yonex was saying the same thing because people were asking about it on the forums and he said, look, this is something that, uh, you know, we, we wanted to do. We wanted to increase the debuff limit, but it was just a tech thing and we were at yeah. eight and then we thought 16 would be good. And then if they like if you guys really, really wanted to, then you could have increased it even more. But you guys thought 16 was uh, was just fine where you were at, given given wow. how far you've gotten tech wise. No, we would have had unlimited if we wanted it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I um, mean, I can't think of a design limit. Right. There's there's UI limitations, right, on how many you can actually display before things get right. crazy. And certainly in individual encounters, you don't want a hundred different things going on because players just get confused or overwhelmed by it, right? But um it we would have never wanted it to have been a tech limit, right? It would have always been limited either by UI or design. And we had more capacity than what we were given in terms of design and UI. So well, because a lot of that stuff was um, also under the hood. Like we hid various debuffs just to track the progress of some raid mechanics and mm. things like that, like timers and things like that. But because we had to use a slot in some cases, right, uh, to make it work uh, early on, uh, it caused problems. And so there were times when you couldn't actually attach that extra debuff, right, because there was something hidden there yeah that was blocking it right mm -hmm. um and everyone was just like well why is this guy have a, a smaller limit than everyone else right but eventually we got into scripting and the, and the game became more advanced technically and we were able to manage some of that stuff without using debuff slots but um yeah this was sort of like our workarounds for we had to use the systems we had to make the content so Right. So when de when designing raids and balancing raids, you know, deciding, okay, how much HP does this boss have? Are you like, mm -hmm. okay, we have 16 debuff slots now. We can make the bosses a little bit harder because more DPS is going out from the raid. Right. Or did you did you intentionally, like, balance around the debuff slots? Uh, it was certainly a factor, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But ultimately, I mean, things just came down to combat time and, you know, like, how long does it take, you know, a group of players to mathematically destroy this thing? given what we know about outputs and things like that um, or how long or can, and is that number smaller than it's berserk timer or whatever timer mm -hmm. it has that's where it's basically just going to become unmanageable and kill the raid. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of it was feel, you know, like we had a mathematical starting point, but then a lot of it was just feel right. and, you know, play it out, test it out. Yeah, that's so interesting. We were also trying to identify play pattern stuff of what's fun, what's not fun, what's confusing, what's not confusing. So Right. Uh, I was going to say, it's it's so interesting because so many people who've, who've been fans of Classic for, for such a long time have always thought that uh, the debuff slots are, are such a big... Like, it was a design decision, and uh, basically mm -hmm. the debuff slots were designed around the, the bosses and the encounters, but right. I guess it was the other way around. where Oh, to protect the bosses yeah, from too much damage. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what everybody thought, or so many people had thought that. But, right. uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's so cool to see that it's actually the other way around. Yeah, it's funny, because like, that is the approach of some designers. I, uh, I'm sad to say like they create sort of an adversarial relationship with their player base you won't kill my bosses i'm going to make it super hard uh, but the content obviously is designed to be defeated right like mm -hmm. you have to put in some effort right you have to work at it you have to earn it uh, but it's there to be defeated right it's there to give you that sense of accomplishment and feel like you've achieved something right so um right. you know game designers typically don't treat them as their personal like they're personally losing if a raid boss is killed, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, an idea that basically protects the raid boss from too many dots, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's never something that we would want to do. 
there was also a few things um you know let's let's pull it back a little bit um talking about the alpha like the Mm -hmm. the development of the game originally there was there was a lot of things that were in the original game or in, in in development in the alpha that got taken out or changed going into release uh I, I want to get confirmation, uh, but also I want to get your uh, your thoughts on it. Hunter Hunters used to have a focus bar in Alpha. Is that yes. true? Yes, they did. So in Retail WoW right now, they've given the focus bar back to the Hunter. Uh, right. What was the original idea of, like, what was the original reason of getting rid of the focus bar for the Hunter and, and going to mana? And uh, then so kind of what we see now. It was an experiment to get the hunter a slightly different um, resource system. We wanted it to be based more around his, you know, shooting, um, shooting and moving essentially. Um, but he had enough mechanics that didn't fit into that scheme at all, like traps, mm-hmm. where um, we were just struggling with, like, well, that just means all this stuff is going to be cooldown based and when things are just cooldown based, um, they're problematic, right? Right, like you need to have something some sort of expendable always. resource. Yeah, so mana was something that covered both of, you know, both parts of what the hunter kit is about. But the, the focus bar was an attempt to create his own resource system that was different that, that so many of the other classes also had uh, with rage and combo points and things like that. So. It was our attempt to get that away, but we couldn't quite get it tweaked and iterated on enough before retail. So we bounced it back to the mana bar. And then I actually don't know what form it takes now in terms of how they solve some of those problems. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'll play a hunter <laughs> and find <laughs> out. But I'm curious. But that was why it was there briefly and why we pulled it before it actually went to retail. Oh, yeah. And then the other question I had was about uh, was about paladin strikes actually. It, and the alpha paladins had a you know a kit that was full of different strikes and whatnot. Yeah. Why did you guys change from the strike system to uh, to what we had on release with paladins? Again, an attempt to do something different. Like um, most of the classes, the melee classes just had a series of strikes. Um, so to create a gameplay dynamic that was a little more interesting, mm-hmm. um, a little more. Um, like I've always considered the Paladin to be more of a chess game than, mm-hmm. you know, a Twitch game, right? Right. Not checkers. Yeah, not checkers. Yeah, not che- really? Not right. checkers. Okay. Yeah, it, okay. T- it takes a chess yeah. grandmaster to play Rep Paladin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So okay. It does. All right. it, it's funny that because this is one of Rob Pardo's classic blunders um, at BlizzCon, where he sort of listed the philosophies behind the classes, and you might remember one of them was easy to play for paladins right which of course just set the community off right like <laughs> oh it's the baby class or it's you know it's the face roll class where you just don't even have to think right but i always considered it more of a chess class where it was like it was more about planning and strategy because he could heal himself he could bubble himself you know like he was so survivable he knew okay well this is going to be a five minute fight right like there's no way you're just going to combo me out and I'm done. This is going to be a long fight. So let me strategize. I'm going to put these elements in play. I'm going to capitalize on these moments that I know are coming up. You now, like, I'm going to plan several moves ahead sort of thing. So I always considered the Paladin more of a chess, mm-hmm. you know, like a longer term strategy. That was the idea. So uh, that's what I got with the seals and the judgment system, right, was a little bit of planning, a little bit of like set up and breakdown and, you know, that kind of thing. And then, of course, Crusader Strike didn't fit in that once we got that whole thing going. Mm-hmm. So that was the reason Crusader Strike got yanked, because Judgment was supposed to be the primary reason or delivery system for I'm attacking with whatever it is I've got going. So, right. uh, And then Crusader Strike came back later. Uh, that system had its flaws, right? And eventually we tried to refine it and move away from some of it. But uh, uh, that was my attempt at putting in an interesting system that was different than the other classes sort of, again, like fell into what I felt the Paladin was about, which was more long-term strategy and plan. Right. So if that was Rhett, what was your idea with the Prot Paladin, which doesn't really shine in, in really many circumstances? Right. Uh, so the Prot Paladin was supposed to be damage from being hit, right? Retribution, Holy Shield, Retribution Aura, um, Holy Shield, you know, things like this, like, 
I would generate threat this way. Um, you know, I would punish evil for daring to attack me, essentially. Um, and then on top of that, um, we wanted his taunt to be more of a rescue operation than a direct, like, insult, right? Like, the warrior is just like, hey, you, you're a jerk, come attack me, right? Very direct. <laughs> Right, I'm intimidating, you know, whatever it is. Whereas for the paladin, the idea was like, oh, one of my friends is in trouble. I'll cast a spell on my friend mm -hmm. and it will transfer the threat to me and get that monster to come over. And right. So that's more right. in line with the thematic that he's a protector and he's a saver rather than, you know, like a direct, you know, right. yelling and screaming. So that was the approach, right? Yeah. Um, the thematic approach. The, the mechanics were difficult because it was much harder to switch targets and use an ability on a friend without the smart target and stuff that eventually went in. And it was to just, you know, hit taunt on the thing that you were already targeted, right? So he had some mechanical difficulties and then he was fine uh, generating threat as long as the thing was on him. But once it was off him, it was really difficult to get it back on him so they could go back to generate the threat, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the warrior was more direct and more yeah. you know uh consistent so uh, just to kind of like uh explain what uh what kevin's talking about is is righteous defense which is a uh it's the paladin taunt that's added in burning crusade specifically yeah because some people were saying like you know no paladin's not taunt in vanilla right but which actually leads to another question what why uh in vanilla originally why, why didn't you guys give him the taunt in vanilla uh because we it's one of those things where we didn't have the idea worked out yet and we didn't mm -hmm. want to just band-aid it by giving him a taunt because once you give him a taunt you can't take it away right? right like anything anything less than that or even different than that then people are going to be like why why would you do this to us just give us the thing we've had right so it's really difficult to take mechanics away but we didn't have the total specific idea worked out on how he was actually going to taunt so we were still experimenting and learning as we went, you know, but our goal and our, our philosophy was always do it different, you know, make, make the bear tank a certain way, make the paladin tank a certain way, make the warrior tank a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to a lesser extent, make the void walker tank a certain way, right? <laughs> right. Like mm -hmm. uh, just have them feel differently, have them function differently so that you get a different experience, you know, and it changes the dynamic of the group and how people have to play when, there's different things going on again like that canvas for different experiences that uh, you change one piece and that other things have to change around it so it makes people think it makes people plan it and keeps them engaged in the moment mm -hmm. to moment so also uh shamans also had some tanking capability early in vanilla and mm -hmm. uh or, or i guess early in the game's development w were they intended to be uh like you know raid tanks or what was the idea no. behind that uh, they were not intended to be raid tanks, but they, uh, until about Sunken Temple, they were actually totally viable as tanks. Uh, but it fell, it fell off a little bit. We didn't mind that they were sort of soft tanks or off tanks, you know, in certain situations. Um, but yeah, they were never intended to be. Looking back, um, you know, because someone mentioned the Discipline Priest tank, was that also like something that we considered? I actually like that idea a lot. I feel like all the classes could do DPS, right? All nine classes could do DPS, but only three, maybe four, if you caught the Warlock Voidwalker, could do tank. And even then it is, you know, questionable right. on some of them. And then only if like four or five could do healing, right? I feel like those numbers are probably off by a little bit, right? Like I probably should have made more specs be tank, more specs be healer, because the average group was one tank, one healer, three DPS. And so because you needed usually a, at least one tank and one healer, that became, those two became the linchpin for every group, right? So uh, probably should have had more specs be capable of tanking or healing in order to keep the game sort of flowing in that sense of group organization right. and getting dungeons run. So it would have been nice to make the enhancement shaman, you know, a tank. Um, the discipline priest, the tank, just to give them a little more opportunity. Potentially, the survival hunter could have been, you know, a tank or even a healer. You know, could have done some first aid style or medic style <laughs> healing. Would have been cool. 
Yeah, that's so crazy to think about. Like, I would totally like just change. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, guys, we uh we are gonna go to Q and A here shortly. Um, again, tweet at us hashtag Classic Cast, and and that's what I'll go through to to pick out some questions. And we'll also look at Twitch chat as well. It's just uh, easier to read on uh, on Twitter. You're probably more likely to to get your question through on Twitter. Uh, Tip Stacey, if you guys have anything else you guys want to touch on. Uh, speaking of tanking and Voidwalker tanking, I'm, I'm just going to yeah. share a memory. This is from Burning Crusade, not vanilla, but so in Burning Crusade, your your pet HP and stamina scaled off of the Warlock's HP and stamina, whereas in mm -hmm. vanilla it didn't. And so I remember right. at one point playing a Warlock in TPC, I gemmed entirely stamina and threw on like a bunch of stamina cloth gear. Yeah. I, was, I, I was tanking heroics and stuff with my Voidwalker. Right. It was crazy. Amazing. There was also that... Uh where you, the Warlock himself was a tank in one of the raid bosses, right? Right, yeah, Twin Emperors, yep. yeah. yeah. I can't remember the raid, but yeah. So crazy things happened, right? But um, yeah, we did consider the, vo the Voidwalker to be like, or we wanted him to be a decent, you know, sort of five-man tank. Anything higher than that, and we wanted, to, you know, um, a primary tank to stand up to be, something that one of the players actually did right rather than a pet of a player so it was, but, it was your uh, vision for in vanilla wow void walkers were going to be tanking five mans yes hmm. okay that's really yeah. cool wow yeah so um, we we probably didn't hit it uh and mainly because of ai right like the ai can just make so many mistakes when it comes to pathing and suddenly the boss turns in the wrong place you know and cleaves the whole party right or whatever it is so um <laughs> You know, little things like that cost, you know, cost wipes. So uh, that's probably the biggest reason. Mm -hmm. uh, just like Hunter Pets aggroing things as you're trying to, you know, uh, streamline the content by skipping rooms or skipping encounters. You know, it's like, oh, Hunter Pet pulled that room. Now we're in for it. <laughs> and they killed two people before you guys are even aware. So, yeah, it's we got some Hunter. issues with pathing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Dismiss your pet, man. But that's my whole identity. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get rid of Fluffy. That's how you guys know I'm not Hunter. Yeah, yeah so I, tough um, moments. I actually have a, have a question here from Thornquist, who's in the chat. He asks, okay. um, Kevin, you had lunch recently with Alan. Did you get the feeling that Alan was eager to dive back into MMOs when talking to him? No, I did not get that feeling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he, he, he plays um, a ton of WoW, though. Like, mm -hmm. Um, he didn't mention it at the time, but I heard later that he was like, he had a huge achievement score or whatever. You know? <laughs> That's one of those things that people judge you on, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so he plays a ton. He definitely had opinions, how eager he was to sort of dive back in. Um, cause you know, that's, that's a big thing for him to come in to the leadership of wow. That's been in place since he left, which is a long time and say, all right, let's start doing things differently now, you know, is, is bad in a business sense, uh, as well as problematic and just changing the game sense, right? So even if he wanted to, which would take, you know, quite a bit of, it would have to be his passion again to like change WoW. And again, some of those things you cannot undo, right? You can't unring some of those bells, right? So uh, it becomes difficult, you know, so I don't know. And he might just want a new thing. I remember we talked about, you know, other games, right? And what other games had taught me about game design since I had stopped playing WoW and MMOs in general, because I was so hungry for other types of things after I stopped playing WoW. I played a ton of things and learned a massive amount about game design mm -hmm. because I was no longer, you know, focused only on that WoW and MMO experience, right? So stuff that can very well translate back into WoW and stuff that also just, you know, convinced me that some of the decisions we made in WoW were the right ones, you know, so. Hmm. Yeah, we talked a lot about that kind of stuff. So this is another question for you, Jordan. Kevin, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, he says, oh, Jordan, okay. what, what were your favorite and least favorite parts of vanilla class design? Oh, my least favorite parts. <laughs> I think I mentioned this in the podcast. Amplify magic and dampen magic and die in a fire. <laughs> um, hated those two spells. Um, probably my least favorite. Uh, probably one of my favorite things is what we accomplished with the warrior. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of games up to, to date, the warrior had been super simple. 
just sit there and take damage, um, throw your one button, which was taunt or whatever, and that was it. And what we were able to accomplish with the warrior that made him, you know, a living, breathing class that got to push buttons and do things and mm. zip around the battlefield. And um, I was really pleased with. So, you know, a lot of the other classes, it's just assumed, you know, like the, the mage is going to be casting spells and doing interesting things. You know, the, the pet class is going to have this cool pet that is part of your, you know, gameplay and fun. Um, you know, the rogue is going to have a stealth mechanic. He's going to sneak around and do stuff. Um, so it was sort of assumed, you know, all of those things. But with the assumption for the warrior, you know, again, to date, was just, yeah, you're just this big bag of hit points that you have to protect and someone has to heal. And as long as you don't die, you're doing a job. So that mm-hmm. wasn't enough in my I, mind. So I still think, uh, you know, 14 years later, the stance dancing mechanic for warriors is the best class mechanic <laughs> that's ever been designed. I think in any nice. game I've ever played. No, it right was great. <laughs> it's really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. Like, uh, cause I did not like EQ bar twisting. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's why pallet boras didn't function that way. We had the tech to prevent it. And so we designed around it, not being something he just focused on, like burning all his globals just to switch and overlap auras would have been really bad. Um, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. And so, and in other games, it had been something that you did, but not necessarily how it was designed. Like, I don't think they ever designed it that way, but the technology allowed for that overlap because of the server ticks. Um, so we were able to solve that problem and I was happy to, but the stance dancing thing I really liked. Uh, stance dancing felt different. It felt very strategic and uh, really fun. So. Mm-hmm. It probably got to a point where it was a little obscene. Um, you know, mixing charge and intercept, especially. Like, I love you know, that. It's just like uh, there was charge and there was intercept, and then there was something else, I think. Oh, it was intervene, right? And it was just like, hmm, <laughs> right? Like, did he just charge or move around battlefield twice on me? Right. <laughs> right. Like, do it a third time now. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, I remember seeing uh, I remember seeing warriors with Spinal Reaper, and what they would do is, they'd go up, they'd literally they could kill somebody and get out of con- combat, charge right. at somebody, and execute and kill like steal the kill basically. And because they have Spinal Reaper, they get a they get a bunch of rage. They get like twenty rage after they nice. after they kill somebody. So now that he has twenty rage, his charge is on cooldown, but he can intercept. So he can go right, right. kill somebody, yeah, yeah. charge, execute, intercept, kill somebody else. <laughs> it's just like right. totally insane. Yeah, and when yeah. We, we tried to balance PvP, it was like always how many tricks do you have, right? Like how mm-hmm. many times can the mage stop you versus how many times you can get out of their thing and charge them, right? And so it ended up being this like always this arms race and mechanics, you know? Yeah. Um, so there's another question uh, that kind of relates to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is from Caro. Did professions influence the classes in any way or vice versa? Did professions have anything to, to like, were they in your thoughts at all whenever you're doing class balance or anything like that? Uh, absolutely. Um, we wanted to make sure that none of the professions sort of stepped on the toes of class mechanics, right? So um, you were just basically subclassing. Um, but we also wanted, again, there to be a big canvas where people could experiment with different combinations, you know, like, uh, especially the tinker class, the engineer class, you know, like, or engineer profession. Uh, that gave a lot of potential for people to try out different things, mm-hmm. uh, which we were excited about. So, uh, yeah, basically what I, and, and I didn't develop the, the crafting, but what I always told the guy who was working on it, whoever it was, was that you can't steal my mechanics basically <laughs> uh, <laughs> and sometimes it still happened in certain ways and i would okay like very very small doses right but um yeah if it was anything like very repeatable or you know just all of a sudden now everyone's got a dot they can throw on things you know like right. engineering comes to mind no, no, right yeah. yeah engineering had a ton of mechanics so mm-hmm. yeah. um well, and sometimes I... stuff would just slip past me and I'd be like, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's one of the things I think is so great about engineering. Uh, a lot of times people complain about the class balance in, in Vanilla WoW. And uh, I get the vibe as a paladin that, like, sure, there's some classes that are better in PvE at this certain thing or that certain thing. Right. But when it comes to PvP, 
I, I kind of feel like everybody does have, like anybody can kill me and I can kill anybody mm -hmm. if I use all the tools available to me. Right. Like if I, if I have engineering and I'm like, okay, well I have something that can fill the gap here where my class is lacking. Right. You know, I could throw a grenade at somebody yeah. if I can't catch up yeah. to them or something like that. It is a big equalizer, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And engineering was a super popular one, obviously, because it did add a ton of mechanics that you didn't normally have access to. Um, mm -hmm. And it's some of the reason why um, the other the other trade skills, uh, we tried to add things that were you could only use if you were that guy, right? You had to make it for yourself, and it wasn't something you could hand out, right? So there was some right. power level coming from you know, your profession, like everyone was sort of getting from engineering. So mm -hmm. we had to compete with engineering, like adding all kinds of crazy stuff. So, right. you know, the, the arm or the blacksmith would get to make a really sweet weapon that, you know, only he could use. Right. So, right. Going to the burning yeah. crusade yeah. with the, uh, was it Lionheart executioner and storm Herald yeah. and all those? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it was supposed to support and enhance the experience rather than step on the toes of or compete with or nullify, you know, that kind of thing. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've, got a, uh, I've got a question here from Stormax. Um, he asks, uh, what do you think, Kevin, about Druid class design overall? And did you, you design Druids, right? Yes. Um, what do I think about it? I think it was, uh, so obviously we wanted to add a shape-shifting class. Uh, that was always the intent. Uh, he was the ultimate hybrid, right? So again, had that really tough learning curve of, okay, you're going to be 80% as good as, as everyone else at everything. And that was just like complete fail, right? Because <laughs> 80% is just not even close to be something that people want, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we had to bump his numbers significantly, especially in like as the main tank on the bear and as the DPS, um, either as Boomkin or... Um, as the cat uh so yeah i thought i thought that the uh the class design was good i just think some of the math and some of our assumptions were off like you always make assumptions about how things are going to be used and how effective they have to be in order to be considered worth using right so and our assumptions were just off you know some of that was just learning experience you know we were learning as we were as we were designing as well so right so, so fair i was gonna Sorry. say going back to class balance what was your idea behind um priests especially have these race specific buffs like fear word mm -hmm. on a dwarf priest what was right. the idea behind that uh yeah we were, i was always trying to do more race specific content um it was definitely experimental like and it it, it actually caused a lot of headaches especially in arenas and uh specifically but pvp in general like mm -hmm. what race of a priest you were actually became a big deal um or at least it was perceived to be a big deal um i think trolls were were a big deal because mm -hmm. it had a soft mortal strike effect that so you didn't need a warrior um and uh so yeah it caused it caused some problems but that was our attempt to like again make your race an important thing create more identity create you know some distinctiveness between you and another priest um and also thematically it was just you know we can't have all the races sort of worshiping light and and having the shadow side to them in equal measures right like a human priest was such a different thing thematically you know, from a, like a culture or whatever religion standpoint, right. even though we didn't really have religions, but um, What's like, an RPG like a troll element. priest was, you know, like, yeah, right. in the classic RPGs, it's like, what god are you? And that gives you totally different abilities. So, right. Um, yeah, so it made sense to us to give some distinctiveness to each of the races, you know, based on their culture and their thematic um, that would tweak them in certain ways, uh, but not, uh, not be overpowering in sense of like, well, you're only this thing. If you're a troll priest, you have to go shadow because the mechanics through your racial spells forced you to want to be, you know, shadow mm -hmm. and vice versa for a night elf, you know? Um, so but that was the idea behind it. But yeah, that they were tough to manage. It was always an ongoing balancing issue. Mm. Um, and obviously giving specific mechanics like the mortal strike debuff uh, to only one race 
on one faction <laughs> was, you know, tough, right? Right. So this, uh, well, actually, real quick, guys, one more time, uh, in case you guys missed it a little bit earlier, uh, we are doing a giveaway for BlizzCon virtual tickets. We are giving away three more BlizzCon virtual tickets. We, we gave away three at the beginning of the stream. This giveaway will be, it, it'll end Saturday night, and we'll announce it at the beginning of the next Classic Cast. We do Classic Cast every Sunday at uh, you know, sometime between 6, 6.30 p.m. Uh, Central Time. So yeah, uh, exclamation point giveaway. Yeah, it's in the chat right now. There's a Classic Cast giveaway there for three BlizzCon virtual tickets. Uh, so yeah, you guys can do that, and hopefully you get a chance at playing the Classic Demo during BlizzCon. So that's uh, that's kind of our way of saying thanks to you guys. You guys have been incredibly supportive uh, of all three of us and uh, just kind of everything that's gone on in the last year since the classic announcement. So that's kind of our way of saying thank you to you guys uh, for all the support, really. And now that we got our you know first taste of uh, kind of getting our hands on classic. Uh, so other than that, it's going to be big. It's going to be big. Yeah, it's going to be very, very big. But uh, the this question actually follows up what we were talking about really really well this is from be the gathering mm -hmm. he says what was mr jordan's favorite class to work on when he began designing if you have one um i was always partial to stealth classes and games probably because of the pvp you know loving side of me uh, so i like working on the rogue a lot um it also had some really interesting uh possibilities with the combo system uh, mm -hmm. because it's scaled so differently based on what you were fighting because you would you would use um basically if you tried to collect too many combo points on a single target that was not elite you'd end up wasting them because it'd be dead before you used your finisher so but then once you got to bigger targets like bosses and things that's when you would play with your five point combo system and use different abilities so the dynamic changed quite a bit between based on the content you were fighting so i thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. Whereas, I actually have. Like, sorry, go ahead. Whereas the early mage, or frost mage specifically, was just like frost bolt all the time, anytime. So, um, at the beginning, anyway. So uh, he was a lot more fun to work on. Mm. I was going to say, I have a, a personal question here. Do you remember exactly what the vanilla WoW server population cap was? And in your mind, for classic WoW, like, or, or just in general, what is the maximum player capacity you think? OG unaltered vanilla Azeroth with like the same respawn rates could reasonably accommodate if you're looking to bump up the server size for classic WoW. Well, um, yeah, so I think Mark touched on this in his classic cast, but it was a design limitation, right? And we always felt that any more than 2K was uh, starting to become problematic, right? Like when you log into a server, we always wanted you to feel like, oh, there's a bunch of people chatting. This is a world full of people, right? Because if there was no chat going on, you'd feel like, oh, it's kind of a single player game. Um, so we wanted you to feel like there was a presence always, you know, no matter what zone you were in. Mm. Um, and now, obviously, early on, we didn't have the population spread as much, right? Like there was a healthy point in the in the game's progression where. Um, you know, people were sort of spread out across the entire level range. There weren't too many people at the, you know, at the highest level, and there weren't, you know, tons of people hitting those newbie zones for the first time and flooding them. Um, so 2K, obviously, is, a, is a, an arbitrary number when you talk about what time of the server's life you're talking about. But we always felt like 2,000 people hit the sweet spot of, like, I log in, there's lots of people talking, but each individual area isn't you know, over camped or, or too, um, too busy to make it, you know, problematic to actually just play the game, experience the game. Like we that's always awesome. wanted you to run into people, right. But not too many people. Yeah. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. awesome. It's cool to hear that. You're right. I've been asking everyone that comes on. I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that the classic team is trying to, you know, wrestle with right now is how big should these servers right. be for sure. Yeah. And 2k is sort of what we settled on. Um, if you remember the, if you were on a busy server at launch, like you had to wait in a queue. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that was login server relief, um, but some of it was just design. Like we didn't want there to be 4,000 people on a particular server, because that's the way things work, you know, if you're allowed to. It's like, well, my entire friend group joined this server. And when people jump in 
for the first time and they see, oh, this server has 3,000 people on it and this server has 500 people on it, I probably want to go to the 3,000 one because that seems like where it's at. You know, like nothing, <laughs> yeah. nothing gathers a crowd like a crowd, right? right. Yeah. Uh, and so you would get this really bad stacking. And so the queues helps put you in a situation where it was like, well, I really want to play. So I could either wait an hour to log in and be on this server that's stacked, or I can go log into a smaller one. And then, you know, once you're on that smaller one, we've sort of got you because you're developing this character you don't want to give up and you're starting to form friendships and things like that. And before you know it, you're a lifer on that server. So, yeah, that's but really yeah. interesting, especially it's, in the context. So it's a design thing. Sorry. Uh, it's really interesting, especially in the concept of classic, uh, in the context of classic, because, you know, there, there's a big discussion about the popularity of classic, how many millions mm -hmm. of people are going to play on launch. And if right. there are millions of people, then how many servers will you need if they go with 2000 yeah. limits? And um, it's interesting. Yeah. And yeah. will, you know, should they up that limit? I mean, they're more, their most important decision is day one, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't want to recreate the launch of <laughs> vanilla WoW, right? <laughs> if you can avoid it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they're going to have to figure out what their caps are like, get mm -hmm. those cues back in place if necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, find a way to pre-register people in some way or something, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe some way to mitigate the, the massive influx that they're going to have right on launch. Yeah. I mean, yeah. theoretically we've learned lessons, right? So <laughs> let's put those <laughs> lessons to, to use now. So we'll see what they do. Right. It'd be interesting. So we have another question from uh, from Twitter here, which I, I think is a good question. This is something everybody talks about every day. But uh, what would you like to see in, in WoW Classic? What would you like to see after it's kind of run its course, after the 1.12 patch? Would you like to see it progress to Burning Crusade? Would you like to see uh, like a 1.13 patch where they start putting in some things like Karazhan and, and things that were in development during vanilla or even prior to right. that ended up not being put into the game? What would you like to see? Well, what I like to see personally, you know, to the, so far I've been sort of ambivalent as far as because one of the one of the fascinating things for me looking forward to classic is uh, how is it going to be received mm -hmm. and what is the community going to want once it's been out, you know, for a little while? Um, how are they going to want it to progress? Are they going to want it to stay 1.13 forever? Are they going to want TPC? Are they going to? You know, because like you can only run NAC so many times. You know, oh, right. uh, that's just for people that are looking to do content that they never had a chance to. Um, some people are just looking to level up again or for the first time in a different t philosophy type of game, right? So um, they might be happy for years, you know, because it seems like there was a time in modern WoW where a lot of people were still not max level and the game wasn't really for them anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so now there will be a game that doesn't mind that they're not max level. And uh, uh, so it'll be really fascinating to see what people want from the game moving forward. And also um, how Blizzard responds to that, you know, like are they prepared to manage two different time periods of game essentially? Like, it's like we've all wandered into the caverns of time mm -hmm. <laughs> we're playing. Yeah. We're trying to play all the classic moments in WoW history, replay them, you know? Right. Um, and so, yeah, that's what's fascinating. What will you guys demand? You know, how many of you will kind of jump in and maybe find out it's not your thing and go back to modern WoW or, or not playing the MMO at all? How many people will be like, no, this is amazing. Keep it going as is forever. How many people are like, sort of a mix where it's like yeah i played it for two years but now i want tbc i want some of those quality of life changes that we have in modern that have no cost uh from a game design perspective and yeah who's going to be in charge of sort of the caretaker of that experience you know yeah you mentioned you mentioned clearing next ramus i've always personally wondered this in hindsight you know burning crusade comes out a couple months after you know vanilla is over mm -hmm. do you guys regret next ram is being so exclusive do you wish you had made it easier or the barrier of entry lower so more people could have experienced it or were you did you want it to be a very exclusive raid i didn't mind it being exclusive um it's funny like because so many people especially streamers um especially you know people that are very vocal on forums and 
they post videos of their content and their play and things like that are playing at the very highest levels, right? And that's uh, great in terms of like bringing people in that might be leveling up because they imagine themselves as you someday, right? Like, oh, I can't wait to get to the content that he's doing, right? So it's sort of the reason they keep playing at their low level in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't take much. It only takes, you know, 5% of the community to actually be hitting the cutting edge content in order to trickle down that sense of that's what I'm going to be doing someday and inspire the rest of the community. But once you get, like, I remember there was a point where like 60 or 70% of the population had been through molten core at some point, this was late on. Um, that starts to change sort of the focus of the game, right? Because if, if the, too much of the community is stacked up there, um, it changes people's needs and the lens in which they view the game, right? And so you get this sense that it's now just a rating game. Right. And yeah. that can have a detrimental effect if, you know, because again, as human beings, we want to make people happy, right? And so if 60% of the population is just telling us, make more raid experience, make raid experience better, and that becomes our focus, Mm -hmm. And guess what you had? You got a lot of people leveling up that are just like, well, what are we doing? Right. You know, like, where's our game? Where are our improvements? Right. So, it's World of Warcraft, um, not just an end game. Right. Yeah. So, I do think there's dangers in too many people stacking up there, um, and you know, difficulty and that kind of thing. Organization actually helps mitigate that to some extent, but um, yeah, this idea. I think that's one of the main problems with you know, um, some designers thinking is that really the end game is the only game. Let's just get everyone up there, right? Um, so that they can be playing the real game. But I don't consider that to be the real game. I consider that to be one part of it. Because mm. I think a lot of people might level up where they might have a boost or something and suddenly they're instantly teleported to the end game where they, they've sort of been convinced is the real game and then it's a totally different game and they might not even enjoy it. They might be like, what is this? You know, why was I pushed so hard to get here when I was having a great time where I was, <laughs> yeah. and, yeah. you know, yeah. like now I've got all these other things that I don't really want to do. It's just not for me. So I don't know, like there's a lot of different play styles. There's a lot of different outlooks. You know, a lot of people are after a different, different things from a game, you know, so they want different experiences. Yeah. And so, you can really you can really get into trouble by focusing too much on one type you know oh yeah mm -hmm. um there's a question here from perplexity mm -hmm. uh, he's asking when you guys designed class abilities did you ever design abilities specifically for pvp or pve in mind or did you just kind of just make abilities uh well there are certain mechanics like obviously resilience was pvp only um and taunt was pretty much PVE only, um, but we never set out to make any ability only work in one. We wanted everything to have usability in as many po places as possible. Um, action bar space was always at a premium after sort of the start of the game. Mm -hmm. And so any button that was too narrow in use uh, was a hard sell, you know, to earn that spot on the action bar. So, um, yeah, the goal was always make it usable different places for different reasons, potentially, but still usable. So yeah. with the exception of sort of the fun, flavorful things, you know, the sentry totems and, you know, I have kill rock and things like those, um, you know, those were sort of outside the, the normal scope of our design and that we just wanted them to be fun and class identifying and, right. and people to be able to interact with the world in a fun way that, you know, kept him coming back with be silly at times and things like that. So, right. This is a uh, this is a pretty fun question. I, I I'm I'm really interested in this one. Mm -hmm. This is from Carlo Nato in Twitch chat. Please ask Kevin about the atmosphere and what was going on in the office during the oh crap moments of balancing, such as when the paladin wreck bomb Kazakh and one shot him. <laughs> what was the general atmosphere like? Um, for me, it was always positive. Like. I love that stuff. I loved it when people found cool ways to, you know, either break the game or do something interesting. Uh, Cause I, you know, having come from Ultima Online where emergent gameplay was 
eighty percent of that game mm-hmm. <laughs> because of bugs and other just oversights. Uh, so much fun could be had because of some of that stuff. But when it happened in WoW, it was usually a pretty positive thing. Like, mm-hmm. um, I know a lot of people would like consider that a bug and feel bad about like the fact that it snuck through or or angry that somebody was able to cheat the system for some reward, you know. But for me, it was always just, oh, sweet, somebody was creative and, you know, broke down something and figured out some secret that allowed them to do something really memorable. So, mm. and that's what, you know, a lot of early WoW was about. Like, the number of explorers in early WoW was just astounding. Like, how many people that have come to my channel um, to tell me about the time that they found this place that they thought no one had ever been to you're like oh yeah this one place that i found if you just shimmy up the side of this cliff and get into a place that you weren't supposed to be like that stuff always makes me really happy because it's like and people just having fun with the game and exploring and there seems to be less and less of that these days right guys we're going to take uh we're going to take one or two more questions before we wrap it up uh one more time we are doing a giveaway uh for three blizzcon virtual tickets uh, if you guys are watching this on YouTube, this will be in the comments. It'll be in the description below. Uh, but exclamation point giveaway in the chat on Twitch. Uh, you guys can get the link to that giveaway, get a chance to play the WoW Classic demo whenever uh, BlizzCon rolls around. And uh, also, Kevin just started streaming on Twitch. So if you guys want to give Kevin a follow, he's failure analysis. So you can see it. You can see it up there on the screen as well. So you guys can go ahead and give. Uh, you guys can go ahead and give him a follow as well. So. So Kevin, are you going to be streaming the demo and then subsequently Classic WoW when it comes out? Uh, I don't know if I'll do the demo. Uh, I might need to wait for the full release uh, of uh, Classic, but I do intend to play both Modern and Classic in the future. So hmm. that should awesome. be fun. And cool. I, yeah, I hope to do like a commentary version or, you know. That would be great. Yeah, even YouTube videos, really like cool. I would love to watch that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that is the plan. I think I'd have a lot of fun with it. And I think a lot of people will get a kick out of just like, you know, seeing the behind the scenes, you know, hmm, the peek yeah. behind the curtain, you know, the, the <laughs> weird old guy, you know, <laughs> Oz, the weird old wizard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, this is a good question from Zulace, and, and I feel like it's it's kind of akin to the uh, to the wreck bomb question. But uh, what did you think about the the wall jumping? The different ways to you know getting on top of Goldshire in or getting under Stormwind. How did you feel about that kind of stuff? Whatever players would do that. Uh, again, I didn't really mind it. Like uh, our our concern was always um, how things looked, right? Like mm-hmm. we did not like it took so long to get flying mounts in, which is not something I really wanted either. But mm. it took Smart. a long time to get yeah. it um, in because the game didn't look good from all angles at that elevation, right? Like the level designers didn't have to spend the time to polish up that kind of stuff, right? Mm. So. The only thing we had to worry about were the griffin rides, right? So it was like, as long as it looks good along this particular path, then we're spooling, <laughs> right? So that was always our concern, our players getting into places where the game didn't look good, right? It was like, oh, the ugly underbelly of some spot they got to, you know? <laughs> so, um, but again, like people jumping around and finding cool ways to, you know, wall jump and get up in the weird places, I thought was totally fun. Now, if it happened to be in, uh, like, a PvP setting like Warsong Gulch, where you had to do some really weird thing, and then a hunter could just shoot you from a place that you could never get to. That became a problem we had to address, right? But um, aside from that, yeah, knock yourself out. Have fun. Hmm. I mean, it, the, the whole the whole one of the big philosophies about WoW is just it's a toy, it's a sandbox, it's a world. Go explore it, go live it, go do weird things. Yeah. You want to you want to invent parkour and in, in wow, you know. <laughs> God bless, right? Yeah, just jumping on the Iron Forge, uh, the little gap in Iron Forge back and forth a hundred times. That's right. Uh, yeah. So And yeah, I think you posted on your Twitch about some uh your or your Twitter uh, as fan about you know the the priest that snuck in and killed the you know killed oh, the yeah. NPCs in Iron Forge. I remember that stuff too, like rogues breaking in and killing bankers and stuff and shutting down yeah. all the time. Right? Like, oh, killing the yeah, auctioneers, like, yeah, killing throwing the infernal in there, all, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, despite the you know the lines it caused at the bank, like it was super fun and I yeah. was super excited to you know see that kind of stuff because again, just people being creative and you know breaking up everyone's mundane day of wandering through Iron Forge doing their typical runs. It's like all of a sudden 
this event happens and you feel like you're a part of it and it's a memory and mostly I just wanted to create stories for people to tell other people about this game, you know, that were interesting. Yeah. So, uh, this is the last question that we'll take. Um, this is from Firehead. Uh, what's the deal with old Iron Forge and why was it never used? Gosh, old Iron Forge. I'm trying to think what that even is. Um, I guess Iron Forge opened up, and this, you know, you, you weren't a level designer, but right. uh, it opened up in the King's throne room, King of Iron Forge throne room, oh. where it went underneath. So, yeah, that's. Uh, do, you, do you have any recollection of why? Uh, I don't. You know? um, it could have been the player housing annex, you know, like, mm. like similar to the one in Stormwind. Like, we intended there to be yeah. essentially housing in, from all the main cities, right? So. Yeah. You know, okay. Different flavors, you know, that kind of thing. Wow. Okay. Well, we'll but, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure exactly. Yeah. Um. We'll do one more question. This is the last one. This is the real last one. This is from right. Mix Baz seven three one. Uh, this is just a fun one. What's your favorite vanilla item and why? Oh, it has to be Penelope's rose because it's my daughter. <laughs> there you go. That is there awesome. Go. That's that awesome. is sweet. It's a, yeah. It's a trinket. Yeah. Feels good, man. Here, I'll show the picture. This is original art from the artist. Uh, wow. Of, that's of my daughter. It was actually a picture we took of her. She's a gnome. In, in the backyard. <laughs> She's a female gnome. Uh, wearing those sandals and holding that rose. And then we sent the picture to the artist, and she, she made this painting, which became a World of Warcraft trading card game card. And it was also an item in. Uh, that is in so, that's cool. so cool. That's awesome. I think it's in so awesome. Strap Home. It's yeah. You guys can find it in Strap Home, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. In Wild Classic. So. That is awesome. Well, yeah. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us, man. This was, uh, oh, this was a pleasure, pleasure for sure. It was great. Thank you so much for coming on, dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for talking about old times, good times. And I'm looking forward to Classic, and I hope it's everyone's dream come true yeah, <laughs> once again for sure for sure i might uh, uh i might have to pick your brain uh, a little yeah. extra on some on some paladin stuff in another video or something but and, uh <laughs> i don't know if you guys are aware of that night at fry's where we we hung out and we signed copies of the game and whatnot you know right before you want to oh. know something i actually have a 10 second video of that i found an old video it's 10 seconds long of that signing nice. there if, if you want to take a look at it awesome but yeah, if uh, you guys want to buy me a ticket, I'll fly out to Fry's and everyone can meet me. There we go. His classic wildfires up. That Fry's is unfortunately out of business. It is not, really. Yeah, oh, for sure. That's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, yeah, really appreciate you guys being here. Me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, guys, if you haven't already, please... Uh, follow tips, follow stay safe, follow Kevin on Twitch and then also YouTube and, uh, and Twitter as well. Uh, all the links are going to be in the description on YouTube and also on the screen now. Uh, make sure to check out that giveaway. If you haven't already, get a chance at getting a free uh, virtual ticket, WoW Classic demo that's going to come out around BlizzCon time. Even if you already have one, maybe you can give it to a friend and uh, maybe maybe rekindle some, some old friendships. But uh, anyways, that, that's it from us guys and we'll see you guys next time. Peace. Yeah, take care, guys. Thank you very take much. Take care, everyone. Thank you.